someone to care for us, someone that we can depend on because we're just not meant to be alone. Our question today has a lot to do with that. This comes from Eric and he says, does God know what I'm going through? Does he have plans for me or not? That's such an honest question, Eric, and we really appreciate you sharing that with us. And so today we're gonna tackle that question. There's a scripture that you may know. It says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That verse is one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. It's contained in one of the most well-known passages in God's Word, the 23rd Psalm. And today, Joyce breaks down that Psalm into how it so beautifully applies to our lives and definitely answers that question. In fact, there's so much greatness in that short chapter of the Bible that Joyce took four sessions in one weekend to teach on it. So today we will share key moments from those teachings as she answers this big question, can I depend on God? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Sheep and shepherds, analogies in the Bible. Jesus is referred to as the shepherd and we are referred to as his sheep. A child proudly says, this is my dad. It puts an emphasis on my dad. And I believe when David wrote this psalm, he would have said it more like the Lord is my shepherd. And I want tonight, really my goal in tonight's teaching is for you to come into a place of feeling safe. Everybody wants to feel safe. And especially women want to feel safe. They want to feel taken care of. That's just in our nature to want to feel safe. I want you to know that you're cared for, that God has a plan for your life, that he's not mad at you, that he knew everything that you were gonna do wrong before you ever even came into relationship with him, and he already in his providential care provided for all of it. God's got you covered, amen. God's got your back. The Lord is my shepherd, I believe David said. I don't want us just to think about a God way off in the sky somewhere, but he wants to have a personal, intimate relationship with us. The difference in religion and relationship is what I just said. Religion always looks for God somewhere and tries to get to God through works and effort and some certain kind of behavior. Are you a Christian? Well, I go to church. Well, that, I, that's not what I ask you. That doesn't make you a Christian. I can sit in my garage for a year and that'll never make me a car. Just because you sit in church, that doesn't make you a Christian, amen? A Christian is not even necessarily someone that does good works. Well, I mean, yes, we, as Christians, we should do good works, but that doing good works doesn't prove to anybody that I'm a Christian. The thing that makes us a Christian is that we have received Jesus Christ into our heart to be our Lord, to be our Savior. We believe that he is the Son of God, God himself, who took our sin upon himself, who took our punishment, who died in our place, who rose from the dead, is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and as we receive him, he comes to be intimate and personal, to live inside of us, to help us with everything. A shepherd is a manager, a caretaker, an owner, a protector, and a provider. Let me say those words again. A manager, yes, he wants to manage your life. A caretaker, an owner, a shepherd buys his sheep. He doesn't just get them free. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, you are bought with a price. You are purchased with a preciousness and paid for, made his own. So then honor God and bring glory to him in your body. A shepherd buys his sheep with money. Jesus bought us with his blood. He died and paid for us to belong to him. You are an expensive sheep. Sheep do not instinctively take care of themselves like some animals do. There's a reason why Jesus refers to his children as sheep. Sheep need endless attention. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and a great deal of special care. They are prone to disease and parasites representing sin, failure, weakness, flaws, and all kinds of messes. They are very fearful, timid, stupid. <laughs> I got it out of the book. <laughs> About sheep, a sheep book. <laughs> and they are stubborn. A jackrabbit can stampede an entire herd of sheep. <laughs> no wonder he calls us sheep. But the shepherd loves the sheep, and he takes care of the sheep. The shepherd never really leaves the sheep. He's always there to take care of them. Even though they have faults, the shepherd loves them and delights in taking care of them. So here's the deal. In kingdom economy, either God does it or we do it. We are partners with God and he will give us things to do, but the part we can't do, we need to back off and let God do. That's the point where we say, I'm not gonna fight it anymore. I'm gonna pray about it. I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna trust his methods, I'm gonna trust his timing, I'm gonna trust his ways, and if God can't give it to me, then I have no business with it. Come on, I said if God can't give it to me, then I have no business with it. One more time, if God can't give it to me, then I have no business with it. It must not be the right thing for me, amen? We need the Lord's guidance. And we can depend on him that he wants to be there to give it to us, but we have to choose to accept it. That was part one of four teachings on Psalm 23. And as we said, there's so much to say about God as our shepherd. And I just love that. That means he's always there watching over us and he's dependable. So let's join Joyce in her second teaching on Psalm 23 as she talks about resting in God. He makes me lie down in fresh, tender, green pastures. That's referring to entering the rest of God. Hebrews 4 teaches us about a supernatural, a Sabbath rest. It's not a rest from activity, but it's a rest in activity. In other words, I'm working up here, and what I do is a lot of work, but I rest in my work because internally, I know that it's not my responsibility to make you like me and make you like what I say. And it, that's, that's God's thing. I've done my part. I've studied, I've prayed, I've shown up, I'm prepared. So we can enter the rest of God when we know what to do and we know what not to try to do. Amen. And a lot of times what we do is we don't do what we should do and we try to do what only God can do. And then we just get all messed up in doing that. Entering the rest of God, it's a beautiful place because when you're in the rest of God, you trust that God's gonna take care of things. You don't know how he's gonna do it. You don't know what he's gonna do. You don't know when he's gonna do it. And you're really not even all that concerned about it because you, you have this faith that God is faithful and he will not fail you and let you down. So when you enter the rest of God, whatever that might be about the changes you need in your life, the changes you wanna see in people, the salvation of your loved ones, your, your finances, let me tell you something, no matter what kind of a problem you have, God's got an answer. He's got a plan. But when we're all frustrated and upset, we can't, we can't receive the guidance of God. So we need to enter the rest of God. And I like this verse too because it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. So here's the thing, we can either choose to or he can make us lie down. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. I'm sure some of you, you've been made to lie down. You got, you got in a predicament where you had absolutely no choice but to wait on God. So he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still and the restful waters. He refreshes and restores my life, myself, my soul. Now, we're a tripart being. We are spiritual beings first and foremost. We have a soul and 
we, we live in our body. Our soul is our mind, how we think, our will, what we want, the choices we make, and our emotions. And I think most of us, if we're honest, would say that we probably recognize that people are led more by how they feel probably than any other single thing. What they think and what they feel. I always call it, I want, I think, I feel. I want, I think, I feel. We spend more time telling God and everybody else what we want, what we think, and what we feel. And God wants to renew our mind, teach us how to think the way he thinks. He wants us to use our free will to choose his will. Free will is a great gift, but it is also a great responsibility. He could have easily created us with no free will where we had no choice but to do what he wanted us to. But that's not relationship. So he gave us this amazing free will, and now he says, I set before you life and death, good and evil. Here's what I'd like you to choose, and if you do, everything will go well with you. So we grow in our relationship with God to learn to think like him, to learn to use our will to choose his will, and then we learn how to learn how to feel the heart of God and to feel the things that he feels and, and to enjoy feelings when they're good but realize that they're fickle and not let them rule us and control us. So it's a lifetime job. How many of you know that's just not something that you get born again and next week that's all straightened out. That is a lifetime job. And, and that's good. That's good. We're in a process. And I'll tell you the truth, I've learned to enjoy it. I've learned to enjoy my walk with God. Uh, this maybe sound a little bit odd to you, but I've actually learned to enjoy it when I receive correction from God because it lets me know that he cares about me. If God didn't care about us, then he'd just leave us alone. Now, it's easier for me to see, receive correction from God than from people, I will say that. Uh, so it's really best to get it first from God because if you don't take it from him, he will ultimately revert to working through people to tell you the same thing he tried to tell you 12 times that you ignored. <laughs> Amen. Um, so he wants to renew our mind. He wants us to use our will to choose his will and learn to learn that feelings are really neither good nor bad. I mean, they can feel good, they can feel bad, but we just have to learn that you really have to stop letting your feelings vote. I remember one morning waking up and I felt so bad, I just thought I cannot put one foot in front of the other one. I just can't do it. Now, a lot of my problem was stress and I didn't yet know what that was. I was working too hard. I wasn't resting. I needed to be made to lie down in green pastures. <laughs> so part of it was my own fault, you know. A lot of it was my own fault. I was saying yes to things I should have said no to and just had a lot that I had to learn. But I remember one morning waking up feeling so bad, I just thought, I, I, oh my gosh, I can't stand it. And I remember I went outside and I sat on the little porch that we had, looked out at the trees, and I said, I knew I kind of had a decision to make. Because, you know, one part of you thinks I can't do this anymore. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and another part, that part inside is saying, but you don't want to give up. I can't do this anymore, but I don't want to give up. And I remember just saying out loud, God, if I've only got one ounce of strength, I'm giving it to you. And you know what? I'm still here. And I'm not, I'm just not just telling you how wonderful I am. I'm trying to encourage you that we have to make the decisions. These are not things that somebody else can come along. They're not decisions that somebody else can make for you. These are decisions that only you can make. And you know, obviously, I'm not just preaching to the people in this room today. I'm sharing this message not only for you, but for the people watching all over the world by TV. And I mean, there are so many messes in so many people's lives and so much pain. I mean, sickness and financial need and relationship problems and just all kinds of things that are going on in people's life. And let me tell you something. I, I feel you. I get it. I understand what it's like to feel like you can't go on one more day. But let me tell you something. When you feel like giving up the most, that's when your breakthrough is the closest. So I'm just encouraging you. Don't you quit and don't you give up because God has got a good plan for you. He's on your side and you are going to have, actually, you've already got the victory. You're just walking toward it right now.
You know, God doesn't use these analogies just for something to do. He calls Jesus our good shepherd because there's lessons we can learn from studying a shepherd's relationship to his sheep. He calls us sheep because there's lessons we can learn from studying the nature of sheep. Why don't you just take a little bit of time? I mean, you can, you can look it up. You can find anything you want now in an instant online. Just, just look up the nature of sheep and see what you get. You'll recognize yourself pretty quick. I, I recognize myself. All right. Some sheep are known to be cast down more than others, and only the diligence of the shepherd helps them survive. When a sheep is cast down, predators move in. For the sheep, it's buzzards, vultures, dogs, coyotes, and cougars. For us, it's the devil. He moves in because a sheep that is cast down, depressed, discouraged, downtrodden, sad, lost their joy, is easy prey for the enemy. The devil does everything he can to keep us sad and mad, but God wants us glad. Because really and truly, our joy is found in strength. You know, whatever you're going through right now, just remember what Joyce is saying about not giving up because I can guarantee you that God will not give up on you and you can depend on him. We'll get back to even more of Joyce's answer for today, but first, let's see how one friend on social media has experienced God as a loving shepherd. This is Alicia and she says, my youngest daughter was in the hospital for eight months. One day I pray, God, I'm tired of crying already. Whatever you want with my child, your will be done. The following days, my daughter showed improvements and started getting better. She went through rehab. We had to reteach her to swallow, speak, sit, and walk, but she got well, went back to school, and is now working full time. God answered my prayers when I surrendered to him. Thank you, Alicia. We're so happy for you and your family, and we really appreciate you sharing that encouragement with us because what you have to understand is while God doesn't always work in the same way or heal in the same ways, he has that same love for every one of us, and he, he is working on your behalf. You can depend on it. So tell us your story. In what ways have you struggled to depend on God, and what has happened as a result of letting him work in your life? Answer that question on Facebook or Twitter. Use hashtag EA. And if you have a question that you would like to ask, we may answer it here on the show. Use hashtag ask. Joyce. You can also do that on Instagram. Just write it on a card and hold up your question right there with hashtag Ask Joyce. And who knows, you may see it here on the show. So right now, let's get back to Joyce with more of today's answer. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, uprightness and right standing with him, not because I've earned it, but for his name's sake. Now, let me just say a word about righteousness and right standing with God. Most of us spend most of our life feeling bad about ourselves, feeling guilty and condemned, ashamed, and like there's something wrong with us. The devil wants to give us wrongness. He wants us to feel that we're wrong, that everything we do is wrong, that we're just not what we should be. And Jesus wants to give us righteousness, our rightness. And you can't, produce something that you don't have in you. An apple tree can only make apples because God has made it an apple tree. And so it's foolish to teach people to behave right if they've not first received the righteousness of God through Christ. That's why just what I refer to as religion, and I don't mean to be rude by that, but when I talk about religion, I'm talking about just uh, following rules and regulations and going through formulas that really have no life and no power in them. Just keeping laws that you think are gonna please God when really Jesus didn't die so we could all have our own little brand of religion. He died so we could have an intimate personal relationship with God through him. When Jesus died on the cross, the the thick, three feet thick curtain that separated, that was in the, the temple that separated 
the holy place from the most holy place was ripped from the top to the bottom at the moment that Jesus died. Why not from the bottom up? There was a point being made. It was too tall for man to reach it. It being ripped from the top to the bottom was clear indication that God was opening up the way now for the common, ordinary, everyday person to enter into the holy presence of God and have fellowship with Him. We don't just need religion. And so, religion sometimes just gives you, gives you a bunch of things to do, but never teaches you who you are in Christ. Now, I went to a church for many, many, many years, and although I learned some very good things, uh, they had a good message about grace, and I learned about being saved through grace, and I, I learned a lot about doctrinal things, the virgin birth, and lots of really, really, really good things. But I, nobody ever taught me who I was in Christ. I never felt any better about myself at all because I had a relationship with God. I still just thought that I was this terrible mess that just could never do anything other than just mess up every single day of my life. And so in 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite scriptures, it says that he that knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, it's just important for me to take a minute and let you know that if you're a born-again Christian, then God views you as being in right standing with him, irregardless of what you do. And I know that's really hard for us to wrap our heads around. You think, well, won't that just give people a license to sin? No, because here's the thing. Once you know really who you are in Christ and the beauty of what he's done for you, sin is the last thing that you're going to want to do. You're going to do everything that you can to please God, not to be right with him, but because you've been made right with him. Amen? So, no condemnation of those who are in Christ. So, it's important for me to let you know that you have a right standing with God, and you're in the process now of walking that out in your life. There's several ways I can say it, but I can say we're always in the process of becoming what we already are. So, we're, not, we're spirit, so spiritually we've been made right with God, but now in, in our experience, we're learning how to walk that out with God. I'm made the righteousness of God when I am born again, but then I get on the path of righteousness, and the Bible says that he makes our path brighter and brighter every day. Now, let's just go back to Psalm 23 here. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, not because I've earned it, but for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, here's the message that I want to get across to you. Even though you're doing the right thing and you're on the right path and you're growing in God, you're pressing on in righteousness, your path is becoming brighter and brighter every day, that does not necessarily mean that you won't pass through what the Bible calls the shadow of the valley of death, which basically just means hard times. So we got, rid of, got to get rid of any kind of thinking, well, you know, I'm doing all this stuff and I'm trying to do what's right and the right thing's not happening to me and I'm just tired of this, so I'm just going to quit and give up. We need to leave the timing of our results in God's hands. Our job is not results. Our job is obedience. We do what we do not even to just get a result but because that's what we believe God wants us to do, and we know that if we do what is right, we will have peace. And listen to me, there is, there is no way that we can ever fail and not be delivered if we're doing what's right. If you got problems in your life right now, you feel like you're being attacked, it's for one of two reasons. Either you've opened the door by doing something stupid, and you've let the enemy in, or you're doing something right, and the enemy's mad about it, and he's trying to come against you to get you to stop it. And you don't need to try to figure out which one it is. You just pray and ask God to show you if you're wrong, keep showing you if you're right, and either way, I'm gonna keep on keeping on, and I'm gonna come out with the victory on the other side. I wanna pray for you, though. Father, I pray for everybody here. They've been such a good, attentive crowd tonight. And 
I pray, Lord, that people remember this the next time they're going through something difficult or if they're going through something difficult right now, that this is working something good in my life. This is going to work out good. This too shall pass, and it's going to work out good. Lead me in the paths of righteousness, and yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, God, for you are with me. So without a doubt, you can depend on God, and we should, simply because we so desperately need Him, and He wants to be there for us. You know, the teachings that you saw today were only a small portion of what Joyce taught on Psalm 23, and there's so much valuable information in there. So our offer today is this. It's called Psalm 23, The Lord is My Shepherd, and it tells you not only how you can depend on God, but it also talks about making the right choices in life, how he wants to help us there and how he will be there regardless of the circumstances that you're dealing with right now. Really good stuff. You can give it as a digital download or like this, four hours of teaching on CD. And for today, we are giving this at any amount, which means anything that you can give, we want to get this in your hands because we know how it will change your life. And if there's a possibility for you to give a little bit more to help get it to somebody else, we appreciate that so much. Much. It really makes a difference. Check out Everyday Study. It's a section on our website that will keep you regularly in the Word of God. It gives you a weekly email update that will just help you to know what to study, what God's Word says, and how important